cannot, need not, tell you how much I miss you. But God is making me feel how rich we are in his presence and love. He is helping me to rejoice in our adverse circumstances, in our poverty, in the retirements from our mission. All these difficulties are only platforms for the manifestations of his grace, his power, and his love. I am very busy, he continued from Wachung when his meetings there had begun. God is giving us a happy time of fellowship together and is confirming us in the principles on which we are acting. Now that last statement was a crucial declaration of confidence for the time. Hudson, alone, and along with all the other missionaries who gathered at Wachung, had recommitted themselves to continue the current course of the mission, and the mission was fast approaching another point of crisis. After years of prayer, patience, and persevering effort, a position of unparalleled opportunity had been reached. Inland China lay open before them. But reinforcements were needed at all the settlement stations in the far north, the south, and the west. Not to advance would be to retreat from the position of faith taken up at the beginning. Not advancing would mean surrendering to difficulties rather than trusting the living God. True, funds were low and had been for years. It was also true that the new workers coming out to China were few. So it would have been easy to say, for the present, no further extension is possible. But not to move forward would mean throwing away the new opportunities God had given. And the feeling among the missionaries was that pulling back could not be God's way for the evangelization of inland China. So the members of the China Inland Mission instead took a bold and startling step of faith. They agreed and then sent home word of their agreement to pray for 70 new workers to come to China. Now at a time when the entire membership of the mission totaled only a little more than a hundred workers, when funds for their own support were greatly strained, the missionaries agreed to pray for seventy more. Since it didn't seem practical to receive and arrange for so many new missionaries in a shorter time, they set a three-year time frame on the expansion. As the conference came to agreement on the matter, someone exclaimed, If only we could meet again and have a united praise meeting when the last of the seventy had reached China. We shall be widely scattered then, said another missionary. But why not have the praise meeting now? Why not give thanks for the seventy before we separate? So they held another prayer service, this time to give thanks in advance for God's answer to their request. But despite this great display of faith, there were many people back in England, friends and critics alike, who doubted that it would ever happen. 1882 to 1888 In faith, Hudson and his fellow missionaries waited for encouraging word and added support from home. But instead of having their faith rewarded with new and greater resources for advancing into the territory, the existing work of the mission suffered a greater shortage of funds than ever. In October 1882 he wrote, We were at table when we received our letters, the home mail, and when on opening one of them I found instead of seven or eight hundred pounds for the month's supplies, only just over ninety-six pounds. My feelings I shall not soon forget. I closed the envelope again, and seeking my room, knelt down and spread the letter before the Lord, asking him what was to be done with less than ninety-seven pounds, a sum it was impossible to distribute over seventy stations in which were eighty or ninety missionaries, including their wives, not to speak of a hundred native helpers and more than the number of native children to be fed and clothed in all of the schools. Having first rolled the burden on the Lord, I then mentioned the matter to others of our own mission in Kaifu, and we unitedly looked to him to come to our aid, but no hint as to our circumstances was allowed to reach anyone outside. Soon the answers began to come kind gifts from local friends who little knew the peculiar value of their donations and help in other ways until the needs of the month were all met without our having been burdened with anxious thoughts even for an hour. We had similar experiences in November and December. Thus the Lord made our hearts sing for joy and provided through local contributions in China for the needs of the work as never before or since. It's experiencing this provision for their current needs, the missionaries felt all the more reassured that God would answer their prayers for the seventy new workers. 
But, realizing the growing doubts back in England, Hudson and his friends gathered for a prayer meeting on the 2nd of February to ask God for some sign that would serve as his stamp of approval and encourage the doubters back home. As Hudson explained, We knew that our Father loves to please his children, and we asked him lovingly to please us as well as to encourage timid ones at home by leading someone of his wealthy stewards to make room for large blessing for himself and his family by giving liberally to this special object. It was just a few days later when Hudson sailed for England, so he didn't hear the results of that prayer until his ship stopped at Aden. Though no word of that special prayer meeting had reached home, the home staff at Perilyn Road had been thrilled to receive on the 2nd of February an anonymous gift of 3,000 pounds. Enclosed with the gift was a verse, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for my possession. And that wasn't all. The gift was sent in an unusual way. It was signed from Father, Mother, and Five Children. It was striking, wrote Hudson, to see how literally God had answered our prayer and led his faithful steward to make room for a large blessing for himself and his family. And by the time Hudson reached London that spring, he recognized a growing respect for and interest in the work of the China Inland Mission. Word of their pioneering work had begun to spread. Alexander Wiley of the London Missionary Society had written, they are opening up the country and this is what we want. Other missions are doing a good work, but they are not doing this kind of work. John McCarthy had just returned on furlough after walking clear across China from east to west, preaching in cities all along the way. Henry Salto and J.W. Stevenson, the first Europeans to enter western China from Burma, had also arrived to share their experiences. So when Hudson arrived and began making known the appeal for the seventy, the Christian community took a new interest in China. Hudson's brother-in-law, Benjamin Brumall, had taken over the responsibility of General Secretary of the Home Council and had made many new friends for the mission. So Hudson was invited all over the country to talk about the work. And everywhere he went, people were moved as they heard the story of the mission and the ongoing needs of China. One of the mission's new friends, a minister from Gloucester, said of Hudson's extensive speaking tour, you could be quite sure that whatever else he might say, he would make no plea for funds. Often I used to hearing him explain, almost apologetically, that his great desire was that no funds should be diverted from other societies to the China Inland Mission, and that it was for this reason he had taken up lines of working which he hoped would preclude interference with other organizations. Nothing gave him more genuine pleasure than to speak well of other missions. Oh, the self-emptied spirit, the dignified way in which his life of faith was lived out, the reality of it all. Instead of wanting to get anything out of it, he was always ready to give to you. His heart and mind were full of that. Some people seem to be asking all the time, though they may not do so in actual words. He never. At one conference where he spoke about the needs of China and didn't even mention his own mission's name, even though no collection was taken, the people emptied their purses and stripped off their jewelry to do donate it to the cause. And, according to one contemporary account, 15 or 16 offers for the mission field were the result, and a whole jewelry case was sent in the next day. People had received so much that they felt they could give anything. Even those who had only heard about Hudson Taylor responded. One child from Cambridge, to whom Hudson Taylor was a household name, wrote saying, if you are not dead yet, I want to send you the money I have saved up to help the little boys and girls of China to love Jesus. Canon Wilberforce of Southampton also wrote at this time urging, Will you do me the kindness to give a Bible reading in my house to about 60 people and spend the night with us? Please do us this favor in the Master's name. And Lord Radstock wrote from the continent saying, Much love to you and the Lord. You are a great help to us in England by strengthening our faith. And from Dr. Andrew Bonar came 100 pounds forwarded from an unknown Presbyterian friend who cares for the land of Sinem. Spurgeon invited him to speak at the tabernacle, and Miss McPherson invited him to Bethnal Green. 
My heart is still in the glorious work, wrote Mr. Berger with a check of 500 pounds. Most heartily do I join you in praying for 70 more laborers. But I do not stop at 70. Surely we shall see greater things than these. If we are empty of self, seeking only, only God's glory and the salvation of souls. So full was Hudson's time with meetings that it seemed he hardly had time for his directorial duties. And yet one volume, used to note mission correspondence when received, when answered, and a line about the contents, shows that Hudson's personal, uh, he personally attended to 2,600 letters in the course of only 10 months' time. There always seemed to be so much work to do, and yet that work was being rewarded. Representatives of the China Inland Mission speaking at Oxford and Cambridge played a major role in the beginning of a student revival which flamed bright and blazed across Britain and eventually to North America. Even at its beginning, it inspired so many to consider missionary services that the China Inland Mission was soon flooded with inquiries and enough support that Hudson was able to sail for China to help prepare for the imminent arrival of the last of the 70 even before the full three-year period was up. Though heartened to know that the mission and its work had grown popular at home, Hudson knew that the expansion in China would mean even greater challenges. Soon we shall be in the midst of the battle, he wrote, from the China Sea, but the Lord our God in the midst of us is mighty, so we will trust and not be afraid. He will save. He will save all the time and in everything. And again, some months later, he wrote to Jenny, Flesh and heart often fail. Let them fail. He faileth not. Pray very much. Pray constantly, for Satan rages against us. There is much to distress. Your absence is a great and ever-present trial, and there is all the ordinary and extraordinary conflict. But the encouragements are also wonderful. No other word approaches the truth, and a half of them cannot be told in writing. No one dreams of the mighty work going on in connection with our mission. Other missions, too, doubtless, are being greatly used. I look for a wonderful year. When he sailed for China, he planned to be back in England by the end of the year. But the unfinished work kept him into and through 1886, the most fruitful year the mission had yet experienced. Hudson spent months on an extensive inland tour, visiting new stations, instructing his missionaries, holding conferences, meeting with Chinese Christians, and even engaging in new evangelistic ventures old colleagues in distant stations, some he hadn't seen for years, shared old memories and rejoiced with Hudson at the exciting new growth of the mission. Younger missionaries found inspiration in the presence and the faithful example of the mission's leader, and in discussions with Hudson, they all dreamed and planned about the future of the work. We all saw visions at that time, recalled one missionary who traveled with Hudson. Those were days of heaven upon earth. Nothing seemed difficult. Hudson amazed his younger colleagues with his endurance as they traveled by foot and pack mule over rugged terrain in the remotest regions of China. Often the inns where they stayed were so crude that the travelers shared sleeping quarters with their mules who would be so hungry that they would eat the straw from the missionaries' pallets as they tried to sleep. Many times there were no inns to be found at all, and in the hottest weather the missionaries were sometimes forced to travel at night. One young missionary, a noted athlete back in England, wrote about the rigors of Chinese travel. Night traveling was one of the hardest experiences I've ever had because I could not sleep by day. Occasionally, when I did drop off, I would wait to find that Mr. Taylor had been looking after me, rigging up mosquito netting to keep the flies away. Walking at night, I have been so sleepy that even the motion could not keep me awake, and having fallen right down while plodding on, the tumble was all that roused one for the time being. The inns being closed at night, we often used to lie down by the roadside where the animals had to be fed. Our own fare consistently consisted chiefly of rice and millet. Occasionally we were able to purchase a chicken, eggs, cucumbers, or a little fruit. But we did not stop at regular stages, and as it was the rainy season, nothing was brought out for sale in the places through which we passed. With so much rain, we often got soaked completely through. The way we managed was to take off our garments, one by one, and dry them in front of the fire. On one occasion, this so offended the kitchen god that Mr. Taylor had to come and make peace. Of course, we carried no bedding, though Mr. Taylor always had two pillows, one for the head and one for the thigh, and we each carried a plaid. 